I'm here today with Professor Stuart Green from Rutgers University who's visiting at UNSW. He's an expert on white collar crime and he's recently been doing some studies into public perceptions of white collar crime. Stuart, I was wondering if you could give us an idea of the type of research you've been undertaking and, and the, the results that have come from that. Well, I've been working with a social psychologist named Matthew Kugler uh, in the United States, developing some uh, instruments to test people's attitudes about, specifically about different types of white collar crime, including bribery, fraud, insider trading, um, theft, uh, and perjury and false statements. And uh, the purpose of the research is to uh, basically see where the public would draw the line between what forms of conduct should be criminalized and what shouldn't, uh, and, and how much, and how blameworthy ultimately they, they regard the, the underlying conduct um, that, uh, that those crimes involve. What findings did the, the research throw up in terms of the way in which the public perceive white collar crime in an insider trading situation? Right. So insider trading is an interesting crime that um, there's a disagreement among scholars about whether it ought even to be a crime at all uh, or prohibited. And so we wanted to know how the public would view, generally speaking, the sort of hardcore cases of insider trading. And we wanted to see what the limits of uh, the public's views were regarding those cases that perhaps should not be treated as crimes. Uh, so we designed a number of different scenarios involving various ways in which people um, came into the possession of inside information and decided to trade on it. And we found that that was quite decisive uh, in, in determining what people's attitudes were. So the mere fact that uh, someone had inside information that wasn't generally available on the market by itself wasn't enough to justify a prohibition, let alone criminal penalties. But when the information was obtained in a way that seemed in improper or inappropriate or somehow infringing on someone's rights, then uh, our study showed that people were willing to treat it as blameworthy and to punish it. So people can see differences in the, in the way in which the information is obtained and the way it's used in terms of whether or not it's even a crime? Right. That seemed to be decisive. So if the information was obtained, say, uh, from uh, the business where a person worked and was an executive and he used that information. Uh, which in some sense belonged to the shareholders or belonged to the company and use that information for his own benefit, then um, our subjects were quite willing to apply criminal penalties and regard that as blameworthy. But where, uh, for example, someone came into possession of the information just fortuitously, say he found it in the back of a cab or overheard it at a ball game, then uh, they were not willing to impose criminal penalties in those cases. So does, does that mean then that the public perception of what amounts to insider trading crime is roughly similar to what the government thinks amounts to insider trading forms of crime? That's right. More or less we found a pretty good um, parallel, pretty good correlation between the law and uh, what, what people's views were. There were some exceptions. Um, uh, in the United States, at least, we, uh, the law that's on the books would allow for criminal punishment even for very minor uh, instances of insider trading, so someone who made a very small profit, for example. And we found that that was uh, a relevant consideration for our subjects. They wanted to know, well, how much money did someone earn as a result of the insider trading? And that seemed to uh, determine whether they were willing to impose criminal penalties, for example. So the, the, what, what's sort of sometimes described as moral luck, the, the amount of money that you actually get out of your criminal behaviour, um, people see that as a differentiating factor in, in punishment? Right, and, and, and moral luck is, is exactly the right term there because even though arguably the blameworthiness was equivalent in both cases, the fact that one person was successful and earned a lot of money and another person wasn't, that seemed to have an effect on what people's views were. And is this the sort of um, finding that uh, studies like Stallman's um, study found, where, where she looked at a, a range of different countries? Right. So um, uh, there have been studies specifically of insider trading that have shown that um, in countries with a very highly developed uh, securities markets uh, and financial sort of regularity, the ordinary citizens were much more likely to approve of and, and to approve of the regulation of insider trading and to be um, critical and show disapprobation for 
insider trading practices, whereas in countries with less developed kinds of financial markets um, and a less developed, developed more normative structure, people were, were much less likely to think that insider trading was wrongful. So in a sense, if, if it's a grey area of, of law or regulation, it's very important to start with the community norms before you try to create laws. I suppose. I mean, the, 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 the idea isn't that we go out and take a vote and ask people what should we do, but I think it's important for legislat legislatures and for uh, prosecutorial officials at least to have a sense of what people's views are. Um, and if you find that there's a great deal of disagreement with what the law is, I mean, drug laws are a good example mm -hmm. of that, or, say, illegal downloading of uh, material from the Internet, if there's a very high level of um, violations of the laws that's occurring, then I think it's an occasion for officials to reconsider whether those laws really um, are good policy. Well, thanks for joining us, Stuart. That's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure.